Cool. Um, I will get started. Um, thanks all for coming and welcome to my fellow WordPress uh, enthusiasts and freelancers and developers and uh, comrades. My name is Ben and today I want to talk about sales strategies for your freelance business or small digital agency. Um, I'll kick it off with a bit of background about my professional experiences and how they culminated in some of the topics that I'll cover today. Um, and then I want to go through how to engage a client in a way that you're defining business objectives so that you can um, sort of satisfy and enable a client's success and really focus on the value um, of your unique differentiators as an agency rather than focusing on uh, just the price in a sale, which I think is a challenge we've all dealt with. Um, from there, I'll go through like some sales basics, so like a sales funnel, and then move on to specific engagement steps called qualification and discovery that I've found really useful in my day to day and uh, really successful for small freelance uh, businesses. Also, want to talk about like how and when to say no to business um, and why. Uh, originally, this was titled Sales and Pricing Strategies. I th I think 20 minutes is not enough scope for uh, everything that would detail sales and pricing, so I really want to focus on best practices that I found in sales. And up next is Georgina, who's going to be talking about um, ideas for recurring revenue, so I think that'll tie in really well to uh, the whole pricing strategy aspect of this. Uh, yeah, before I move on to my background uh, experience at Pantheon, I want to begin with a quote from ancient Greek philosopher Jay-Z, who in, <laughs> I believe, 900 BC said, I'm not a businessman, I'm a business man. I'm not a businessman, I'm a business man. And I think that's a central point uh, and focus of this talk is that we all have this idea of the archetypal businessman, this, um, you know, finance savvy and outgoing personality. Um, but I think that to be successful freelancing, you also have to be a business. You have to really be reflective and introspective and know what makes your services unique and be realistic about that. Uh, you know, why do, why do clients come to you? Why do they come back to you? What do they say about you to their friends and to their colleagues? And I think understanding those points and really being a business is, is central in selling the value that you're providing to clients. Um, yeah, I think this will lead to more sanity and hopefully dollars. So background experience, um, I'm a partner manager at Pantheon, meaning my job is to identify key strategic partners and also qualify uh, enterprise deals and then move them through a sales funnel, which I'll talk about in a second here. Um, but it's given me a pretty unique juxtaposition of our business, our professional business of, you know, 100 plus people uh, compared to that of the small digital agencies that I work with uh, or freelance businesses. And primarily I see a lot of disparities between um, growth goals of these freelance businesses and then their realistic sales processes and historical conversion rates. Um, there's often a big parity in between those two and I think it's really interesting. Um, often being goal oriented is not enough. I think, again, you have to be a business. You have to really be introspective and understand what it is that makes you unique, what your services are um, comparative to others in the market, and then be able to tie those to specific buyer needs. And that's what uh, this presentation is going to cover. But to be clear, when I think of like the self described sales guru or as sales aficionado, I kind of hate that person. I think that person is really frustrating to deal with. Uh, when we think of salespeople, we think of like cold callers who are just annoying and intrusive and obtuse and aggressive, and they're just like interrupting your day. It's like, hey, this is sales brosif that you've never heard of. I'm here to talk to you about ABC today. And it's like, yo, I've never heard of you, man. Like, click, goodbye, get out of my face. Um, I think salespeople are also, they're bad at listening. Um, I remember trying to buy my first car in high school, probably sometime in high school, and I remember walking on the lot. The guy's like, oh, you have $5,000 to spend. Like, let me show you this year's Escalade. And I was like, homie, I told you I work at McDonald's, man. Like, I need to see the 1995 McChevy Malibu with fries, not your new Escalade. It's like, are you even listening to me? 
Um, and furthermore, I think that salespeople are sort of cocky. Uh, again, the self-defined sales expert is like, you just have to be like me, and then you'll be good at sales. And I don't think that's right. I think that like, you can be your own personality and still uh, have success. You can still make money and keep your soul. Um, the point of this presentation is not to say you have to be this certain personality type or you have to do things a certain way. Uh, again, I think you can make money and still keep your soul. Um, yes, so the point is sales is about taking on projects which are a good fit for your organization and for your goals. Um, and finding customers who actually value uh, the differentiators that you bring to the table. Um, so we've done a, a number of profiles of all the eight, thousands of agencies that we work with. This one is looking at like projects that are new versus retainer-based or uh, maintenance fees coming from existing clients. Um, we found that like 93% of people to some extent are looking for a recurring stream of revenue because it's more predictable um, and that's what they rely on on their business. The point of the slide is not to say that you should be chasing any type of revenue or any size of client. You should know uh, what you're chasing and you should do that and you should only do that. Um, the point again is to really know your position in the market and to know the value that you're providing clients um, and just be true to only that thing. So I'll move into a couple sales basics here. The first and foremost being like this sales funnel that I've mentioned before. Uh, it's a pretty basic concept where you're working towards a specific growth goal, which is usually dollars, or it could be percent retainer clients, or it could be a number of new employees that you wanna hire by the end of the year. Uh, but whatever it is, you're working towards a specific, simple growth goal, and that would be defined as like the uh, blue piece at the bottom of the funnel. The basic idea of sales funnels is that you work your way backwards from blue up to green, up to orange, up to however many steps you have. I think Pantheon has like 11 well-defined sales steps. I would suggest keeping it simple. Three to five is, is probably more than enough. I put four pretty standard ones up here, leads, qualified leads, proposals, growth goal. The basic idea of this funnel is that you're working backwards from blue in a sort of reverse waterfall uh, to understand how many bite-sized day-to-day activities you need to be sprinkling in the top of that funnel to then convert down to your goal. So for instance, if your goal was a million dollars in revenue by the end of the year, you would want to understand your historic win rate as well as the average size deal that you usually take on. And that would help you understand what the green piece of the funnel is or proposals in this case. So if you win one out of every two proposals, and each project is a million dollars, then you need two proposals in that green area because you're probably going to lose one as historic show and that's going to get you to your growth goal. From there you can work backwards again to see, okay, well, based on historical data of how many, how, what percent of my qualified leads turn into proposals, then you can extrapolate that data from green out to orange and say, this is how many qualified leads I need to be sprinkling in this funnel to work down to proposals, to work down towards my growth goal so on and so forth. Again, you can keep it super simple. It can be three to five steps, um, but just know what that growth goal is and keep measuring it. So a very obvious statement. People spend money on things they value. Uh, people spend money on things they value. And as such, People value different things. You're gonna encounter one person one day who values A, B, C, and the next person who values D, E, F, and it's gonna be changing a lot. Um, also, your agency provides value. That point actually doesn't change all that much, I would imagine. Um, again, you should know what that value is, but the challenge in sales, I think, is in these sales engagements, not blabbering on and on about how cool your value is or like how awesome a is, like, if my agency provides A, B, C, I don't need to be talking on and on about how I revolutionized B or how C is better than D. Um, the point is the, the different things that people are valuing is going to change, and it's your job to understand and discover what those values are so that you can tie the value that your agency provides to the things that those people value. Um, so, for example... Let's take like a website. Um, if I'm a developer at an agency, I probably 
I probably value tools that make coding a lot easier. If I'm a marketer, I value SEO specific plugins and s sparkly templates, etc. If I'm an agency, um, I might be I might do design and development and even hosting for all of these websites. But you also might have a developer who is really savvy with SEO, or you might have a uh, like a, a designer who's really gifted with iterating on a client's, um, like dealing with clients. Or maybe your agency's won a number of awards in some sort of field um, for some excellent projects that you've pr produced. Um, again, everyone's value is different and people value different things. Another point I'd make is, and I was just talking to someone before this presentation about engagements where it feels like a race to the bottom where the client is just like, I just want the cheapest project ever. I want to pay $0. It's like, all right, goodbye, sir. It was nice to talk to you. Um, and it, you think about value on the reverse side of that. If you needed brain surgery, it's not like you're going to Groupon to go find a brain surgeon. Like, If there's a high value that you have in a service or product, um, you're going to be willing to spend money on those things. So I think sales is a much more productive conversation when you're asking questions about value rather than just what the budget is. Um, and also, let's be honest, clients usually lie about budget. I think we all do. Move back to this basic sales funnel idea. Again, working towards a growth goal. There's two specific client engagement processes that I want to talk about, which are discovery and qualification. And these are specific actual meetings that I lead that the basic goal of both of them is to move someone from a higher field in that funnel to a lower uh, field in that funnel. Uh, the first one is qualification. There's a number of ways to look at this. BANT is the most common, so budget, authority, need, and timeline. Um, is, am I talking to someone who has budget that's commensurate with my services? Am I talking to the person who can sign the check? Does this person actually need or want the things that I provide? And is their timeline uh, in line with my my typical project timelines. Um, a, a thing I'd note here is disqualifying is just as important as qualifying. In fact, it's likely that you're winning less than 50% of the time, um, I've found. And as such, you should know when it's time to walk away from a client. Uh, I think we've all got bogged down with these engagement processes where it's like, I met with all the VPs and I met with the marketing head and I met with the technology head and I took the interns out for lunch so that they could go tell their boss how awesome I am to work with and then you end up losing the deal because a competitor moves in with a smaller price or a better service. And when you, in hindsight, 2020 vision, you were not realistically lined up to win that RFP or that complex process in the first place. Um, and I, I hear a lot of agencies who are kicking themselves for having spent so much time in cycles spinning on something that probably wasn't going to happen. Um, and honestly, BANT is like, it's very basic, but often it's not enough. Again, people are lying about budget. Often people are lying about being the one who signs the check or pushing it off and saying, oh yeah, the decision's on someone else. It, it's, the purpose of BANT or qualification basics is more about like understanding someone's goals and understanding their challenges and understanding their timeline and really understanding what they're looking for. And if it sounds like a good fit, then let's move forward. Let's keep engaging with each other. And if it doesn't sound like something that my agency is really going to win or my business is really going to win, then it's time to walk away. So that's the first of two specific engagement processes that I go through in a sales cycle. Um, and I'll be really upfront about these meetings. It's like, hey, the goal of this 10 minute meeting um, is just for me to qualify out um, the project at hand. I'm gonna ask you a couple questions about your needs, about your challenges, about your timeline, to make sure that this is a good fit and that this is a conversation that both of us should be having and it's a good use of both our time. To my point, uh, the worst thing isn't failing, it's taking a long time to fail. Uh, again, taking that anecdote of a really long sales engagement that just doesn't pan out and that you were probably over-optimistic about in the first place, um, it's, it's better to fail fast. And I think Stephen made a similar point. Um, also, so after 
you have vetted out this conversation and you find that it is qualified, then the second of two specific engagements that I would lead um, is called discovery. And to be clear, I've, this is, this isn't like a paid discovery process. This isn't a big long engagement. This is a specific like hour long meeting where I'm talking about, um, you know, main points and I'm fleshing out this qualified opportunity. Um, the basics that you want to uncover are like, what pain is this person experiencing? What challenges have you had? Why are you talking to me in the first place? Why are you considering spending all of these dollars on something? What, what caused this scenario to happen? And then from there, move to like the future states. Like, where do you want things to go? How do you want things to change? Uh, what would your life look, life look like if you did work with me, if you did purchase my services or product? Um, and then during this conversation, really p extracting uh, what specific business outcomes they're looking for. So that could be metrics. It could be performance speed, for example. It could be le one less full-time employee. It could be anything, but really pulling out a specific thing that this person wants to accomplish is, is the whole point of this discovery process. Um, again, it's contrasting the pain and the past and what is happening today against the bright future that your freelance business can provide. Um, these are just some basic rules of discovery. I think the most important is listening more than you're talking. I mentioned this before, but I think we tend to blabber on and on about how cool my agency is and how good we are at ABC, um, but it's really about uncovering what this person wants to accomplish and the values that they have um, so that you can tie your unique agency-ness to what this person needs. Um, ask open-ended questions. Yes or no's tend to fall flat, but if you say, what would your like, life look like, or um, you know, tell me about this particular experience, uh, how, how would you like things to operate in the future? Open-ended questions tend to be more, it's almost like a psychiatrist chair, people will really open up if you're op asking open-ended questions. Um, and again, just resisting talking on and on about your products and services until you have enough information to actually tie their needs to your unique value. A um, Couple of takeaway points. So the sales funnel is a really basic idea where you're working backwards in a reverse waterfall from a, a growth goal that you have as an agency to really simple bite-sized day-to-day activities. It could be at the top of the funnel, it could be leads or emails that you send out or um, networking meetings that you go to, whatever it is, like just make them really simple and quantifiable and easy to understand. Um, second point, only pay attention to qualified opportunities. The budget, authority, need, timeline, or what are your goals and challenges and timeline. Um, the worst thing isn't failing, it's taking a really long time to fail. So your time is valuable, don't waste it on lengthy RFP processes or people who don't seem engaged with you in the first place, focus on the places where you could probably actually win. Um, and last, just be a businessman and a businessman. Like, be good at all of the businessy stuff that we all know is true about professional salespeople, but also be a business. Like, know your value, know what you're bringing to the table. Um, don't lie about those things and focus only on those things. Uh, focus on the value that you're bringing to these clients and not just the price tag on your service. Uh, yeah, questions? Yep. That's a good question. So, and just to summarize, he was asking about talking about value and not just price, where one of the first questions people ask are, what does your service cost? 
Um, the point I was trying to make is like to not hold, like hide the ball on pricing and not try to like beat around the bush about it, but just to be upfront. And oftentimes when I get the price question, I won't answer directly. I mean, there is obviously like some sort of project scope that you need to understand, but I will say something like, uh, you know, the last three deals at an agency of your size that I closed were 53,000, 37,000, and 42,000 dollars. And so don't hide the ball. Just open up that conversation, and, and maybe that's sticker shock for them, and they're like, whoa, that's expensive, and you're like, yeah, man, it's expensive. You ready to talk, or do you want to go away? Um, is this qualified? Do you want to keep talking, or do you want to go away? I just want to understand that. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was adding, like, by focusing on value, it's not a race to the bottom, but you can all oftentimes actually raise someone's budget by focusing on value. Um, and the more questions you ask, the more value they realize that you're bringing to the table. So asking questions like, oh, how much did that outage cost you? Uh, oh, how many dollars and cents did that cost you? How many full-time employees are you going to have to hire to tackle this problem? How much are you going to pay them? Oh, that sounds like a lot of money. It sounds like I could be bringing you a lot of value. Um, and by focusing the conversation on those points, I think you can kind of get away from just focusing on the price tag. Hey. In my experience, is it better to have a fixed rate or to change based on the client's rate, I, uh, based on the client's budget and need? Um, I think understanding the value first is really important in working towards a price tag. That said, like there's always some flex room. I, I don't think anyone has a fixed price. There's always the friend discount, the I've spent too much time with you already discount. There's the I really want to win this logo discount. Um, so I mean, I think we're all kind of flexing on price in some regards. Uh, that said, I think you should know what your goals are for you know, margins and growth goals as you have those conversations. Yep. Um, is it better to keep it secret? Uh, we many don't like publish a specific project price because again the scope is, is there's a myriad of different um, variables in each project. But again, I wouldn't hide the ball on price. I would just be upfront and say. You know, typically my services are perhaps expensive for you, and just get it out in the air, and if they wave you goodbye, then that's great. You have more time to focus on better things. Yep. Yeah, he was saying there's a lot of times where prospects get caught in a specific part of his funnel. Um, I, I would have two responses. One, first, 
identifying where they came in from. So did you meet them at an event? Is it a recurring client? Was it a referral? Um, is it a specific type of engagement that you think is getting stuck? Because oftentimes uh, I found that it is. It's like, oh yeah, all of the, I, I paid a couple thousand dollars for Google AdWords or some online advertising service. However, all of the leads, like they don't seem to wanna actually engage with me. It seems like they were just looking at clickbait online. Um, so really identifying where these people came from in the first place, I think, will help you identify where you should be spending more time and why those people are getting stuck at a certain point in the funnel. Um, the second being, I, I mean, we're all working towards not having to spray and pray a zillion emails out and hope that you get one response in the dark, but being really thoughtful about your outreach and who you're talking to, um, I think will also lead to better leads or whatever you wanna call that first step in the engagement process. I do have uh, probably just one more question and then I can take, I'll be at the happiness bar uh, to answer questions. Sure. Yep. Yeah, yeah, she's asking about tire kickers, which is a huge problem for me and for every sales professional. Um, oftentimes, like, I will leave uh, not an ultimatum, but a, you know, hey, my services cost this, or, or more basically, to continue this conversation with me, to continue to use my time and yours, which I realize is valuable, I need to make sure that you're on the same page with me. I need to make sure that you have this budget or that you have the authority to sign this or that you are dealing with these challenges and that you agree that the value that I'm bringing is in line with the things that you need. So kind of setting up, a, I guess, almost an ultimatum for the next point in the conversation is helpful. I have some more ideas, actually, that we could chat about. Um, I do, I want to be conscious of the next speaker who's up. So I'll, I'll be at the happiness bar talking. I saw a couple hands raised and, and we can chat there. Cool. Thank you.